This videotape is on the radiographic techniques and radiation safety training for veterinary technicians. The radiologists involved in the production are Robert Lewis, Mary Mahaffey, Barbara Seltzer, and Elizabeth Watson. All four are diplomates of the American College of Veterinary Radiology and are associated with the Department of Anatomy and Radiology, College of Veterinary Medicine, the University of Georgia. Technical assistance was provided by Tim Jarrett and Ann Toth. The production manager was Gary Burton of the Educational Resources Center of the College of Veterinary Medicine. This videotape was sponsored by the Georgia Veterinary Medical Association located in Norcross, Georgia. Financial assistance was provided by the Atlanta X-Ray Sales and Service of Duluth, Georgia. I'm Dr. Robert Lewis of the University of Georgia and will be the narrator of this videotape. I am only one of several individuals who have spent many hours in the production and completion of this tape. The Georgia state law requires that technical personnel involved in radiographic procedures must have a minimum of six hours of training in radiation safety. This videotape is designed to meet that state requirement and is specifically for those technical personnel involved in veterinary medicine. In our discussion here on radiation safety, we're first discovered by Dr. Rentgen, who was a physicist working in Germany, and he detected that radiation came from a vacuum tube that he was discovering. And the first radiograph, which was ever published, was a radiograph of his wife's hand, and it was in the original publication in 1895. So x-rays have been with us for a long period of time. The use in veterinary medicine did not show much promise and was not very extensive until 1930s, when Dr. Schnelli, who was with the Angel Memorial Hospital in Boston, first published the book on the use of x-rays in veterinary medicine, particularly with dogs and cats. Dr. Snelly then became a leader in propagating the use of radiation in veterinary medicine as a diagnostic tool. The hazards originally were known to some extent, particularly to the people who had worked in the laboratories with radiation, but many of the latent effects and, and the results of conditions which came from low doses of radiation were not fully understood until after World War II. These were brought about primarily through the use of the atomic bomb in the Second World War and the effects of the nuclear race from thereafter where many people then became concerned about not just the people that were working in radiation, but the general public and trying to provide a safe environment for all of the general public. The first veterinary organization that revolved around radiation was an organization developed in 1957. The teachers of veterinary radiology in the colleges of veterinary medicine met and at that point there were only about half of the colleges that had a designated individual that was teaching radiology. So you can see that it's only been the last 
40 to 50 years where radiology as a diagnostic entity has developed well in veterinary medicine. Today, the use of x-rays and the production of radiographs is a very significant part of the diagnostic regime in clinical practice. Our goal is to show and discuss the various aspects of radiation and to illustrate the safe way of using radiation so that you as a worker will receive the smallest dose possible. The sources of radiation that all of us are exposed to in some way or another are quite varied and we need to at least understand how those have an influence on each of us and the amount of exposure that we're going to get from each of these. First, I'd like to talk about environmental sources of radiation, and first is the cosmic radiation. All of us have been aware of the radiation that comes in from outer space and continues to strike the Earth, and today with the concern about the ozone layer, there's even concern about whether that protection of the Earth that is provided by ozone is diminishing, and we may in some sense be receiving more cosmic radiation. The amount of radiation that the average individual receives from cosmic is about 44 millirems per year. So now we're beginning to look at the accumulation of a dose that all of us are going to get exposed to. Now, with cosmic radiation, it makes a difference where you live as to how much of that you're going to receive. For example, if you live at the seacoast, where you have the greatest amount of atmosphere above you, then the atmosphere will protect you and you'll get somewhat less cosmic radiation. If, for example, you choose to live in the mountains, for example, if you are living in Denver, then you are living at a little bit more than a mile up into the atmosphere, so there's less atmosphere to protect you and absorb the radiation, so you will get a higher cosmic radiation in Denver than you will at the seashore. So we often think about the hazards of mountain climbing as not just being falling off the mountain, but also the increased radiation that you'll get at those high altitudes. The other interesting area where cosmic radiation comes into play is the increased hazard of radiation of flying in an airplane. Again, the airplane is going many miles up into the atmosphere, and as a result, you are losing that protective atmosphere absorption of the cosmic radiation, and even though the plane itself is providing some barrier, you're getting somewhat more radiation at high altitudes in the airplane. So it's not only worrying about the crashing of the airplane, but perhaps a little bit of increased cosmic radiation. Not that that will prevent you from going someplace when you want to get there in a hurry. The second area then of environmental source is the Earth's crust. There are naturally occurring isotopes that are just part of the environment of the Earth's crust and all of us are exposed to those in one way or another. The average exposure here is somewhere around 75 to 100 milligrams per year. However, there are certain areas of the Earth's crust, particularly in Brazil, where the isotope concentration is extremely high, and you may get up to five to 6,000 milligrams a year in those environments. So again, dependent upon how you're, uh, where you're living and the dose rate of that particular area of the environment becomes very significant. For example, if you live in a brick house, brick is going to have a higher level of the Earth's crust radiation than does living in a wood house. And so, again, not that that becomes the primary reason for deciding to live in a brick house or a wood house, but a brick house will have a slightly higher dose rate than a wood house would. And then we think about the dose rate that's in your body. Each of us, in a sense, is a small radiation entity walking around because as we live and survive, as with any living organism, we are eating plants and animals that 
have lived also on the Earth's crust, so they take in some of the radioactive elements, and in the process, our body metabolizes those elements, and certain ones, particularly the ones related to bone formation, are retained within the body for extremely long periods of time. Again, not that we are great sources of radiation, but it's of some limited significance. The fourth thing then that becomes from the environment is man-made radiation becomes a part of this. We think first and probably foremost because of the publicity of nuclear power plants and the threat of nuclear war. And these entities provide very low doses. For example, all the power plants today are estimated to contribute possibly three to four milligrams per individual that's in that environment which as you see when you compare that to the cosmic and the Earth's crust is a very low dose and a relatively safe risk for the most part. The other sources over the years that have been of concern is some of the early televisions, microwaves, and other devices that will produce the electromagnetic waves of radiation, but today most of those are manufactured in an extremely safe manner and unless they are misused or broken in some way are of little consequence from the standpoint of radiation to most of us. The second large category of radiation that we get exposed to is through medical sources or the use of x-rays and radioisotopes in diagnosis and treatment of diseases in people. The most common way and the greatest source is x-rays. Most of you have one time or not in your life have probably had an x-ray made of your part of the body and in producing that x-ray you have received some limited minimal dose of radiation. The question always comes is the risk factor of the damage from receiving the radiation versus the tremendous benefit of being able to make a correct diagnosis and hopefully lead to the proper therapy of whatever your condition was. So x-rays are fairly common. Most people at some time in their life undergo that. The other area that has developed in the last few years is the use of radioisotopes, primarily in a diagnostic uh, mode where radioisotopes are used to trace many biological functions and detect where abnormal function is present within the body. These are usually extremely low doses of radioisotopes and the amount of radiation individuals receive from this technique versus x-rays is usually very minimal. The third category then comes in radiation therapy. And in radiation therapy, the individual involved gets extremely high doses. But yet the risk becomes, is the radiation going to kill the cancer and bring about a cure or, if not treated, would the individual die of the cancer? So the risk-benefit ratio in therapy is primarily for the individual that has a high-risk disease to start with, and the dose rate involved in radiation therapy is not spread evenly with the population, but is only in very limited number of individuals that need the radiation to help bring about a cure. The third category then that involves us as workers in radiation has to do with occupational sources. Those of us that have chosen to work in the field of radiation or have increased our dose of radiation because of our occupation are in a special category and we must look at how we're going to be treated. Those of us that work around the production of x-rays and veterinary practices because of our restraint of the animal and our involvement of being close by the machine at the time that radiographs are made are going to receive some minimal dose. It behooves us that if we're going to consider the dose rates in occupational exposure, we have to exclude all medical uses and in a sense all environmental uses and just be concerned about that dose that becomes we are exposed to because of our occupation. The other types of individuals that may have some occupational exposure 
are again the airline pilots because and the astronauts because of the altitude and then workers in nuclear plants and all the people involved in the medical use of x-rays become occupationally exposed. We will discuss the limits and the provisions made for trying to protect and guide you in understanding what this risk is in your workplace. As with any discipline, we need to understand what the units of measurement are so that we can have a common language to discuss the amount of radiation that we're exposed to. The first unit that we will use is the Rentgen, which is named after Dr. Rentgen, who first discovered the x-ray. And I'm going to read you the definition of a Rentgen, and we'll probably never come back to it after that. A Rentgen is that quantity of X or gamma radiation such that the associated corpuscular emission in 0 0.001293 grams of air produces in air ions carrying one electrostatic unit of electricity of either charge. This definition is based on the ionization capability of the radiation and the detection of that ionization with air changes that go on. The other units that we will be discussing is the REM, not the rock group, but it stands for Rentgen Equivalent Man. This is a unit of exposure that is used commonly when we're discussing the exposure of personnel that are receiving radiation. The new term, which has been introduced in just the last few years is a sievert. It is an international term and it is equivalent to 100 rems. We will probably not be using this in the rest of the discussion, but just so that you understand the more current terminology that is being advocated. The second one then is the RAD or the RAD, which is, stands for the Rankin Absorbed Dose. This is the unit of the absorbed dose of radiation and represents the effect within the individual or organism. The new term and corresponding to the Siebert is gray and a gray is equivalent to 100 rads. Again, we will probably not use the gray in our further discussion, but we'll primarily work with the REM and the RAD as we discuss the various dose levels that, and exposure levels that are presented from various activities. Now if we'll discuss the effects of radiation and what kind of potential damage could we see if you received large quantities of radiation. For the most part, the effects of radiation are best understood by putting them in two classes. One is somatic, the other is genetic. With somatic damage or the effects of radiation, it is primarily to the individual. So that if you are the one that is receiving the radiation, these are the possible effects that you might receive. Now you have to realize that even though most of the things we're going to talk about are very serious, it takes extremely high doses to create most of the things we're going to discuss. They are not in the realm of using radiation and you being occupationally exposed. Majority of this work has come out of the studies that were from World War II after the two atomic bomb, bomb blasts, as well as being supported by the data that has come from the nuclear accident at Chernobyl. For example, the individual with high doses may get cancer, particularly certain kinds of skin cancer where the dose rate to the hands and to the fingers and some of the early workers in radiation got extremely high doses and they were using no protection, developed squamous cell carcinomas. The chances of today with the way we operate with lead gloves and having very efficient systems for producing radiographs, that is almost an impossibility. Many of these people also receive burns. One of the few places where burns are probably evident today is in therapy patients, where these individuals are getting seven to 10,000 rims of radiation. Very high doses relative to what we will receive working in radiation. 
Leukemia is a specialized form of cancer and can occur again. Leukemia may occur with low doses over a long period of time where the first two are more likely to occur as very high doses in a shorter period of time. Life shortening is another thing that has been studied with radiation, they, particularly in animals where very low doses have been shown in some studies that they will have an effect on lifespan. They're not quite sure what it is. It's sort of an increased aging syndrome. And personally, I've been using this argument for years to try to get paid more money because I get time to convince everybody I wasn't going to be here as long, but it hasn't worked and I'm still around, so I'm not real sure where it fits. Last has to be death, which I guess would be the most severe form, and again, talking extremely high doses, death can come in several forms. There is sort of a molecular death, which is associated with dose, dose rates of one time, whole body, not just pieces, of 100,000 rem. And then that occurs very quickly, usually within minutes. The second type of death is the involvement of the central nervous system, where the dose rate is in terms of usually 10,000 or greater REM, and that death is due primarily to a swelling of the brain within the calvarium, and that death will usually occur around one to three days. There is another type of death that is related to the gastrointestinal system, and the dose rate here is usually somewhere between 1,000 and 5,000 rem, and it takes about five to 10 days for the intestinal tract to be destroyed and create death by the loss of fluid through the GI system. The third type then has to do with damage to the hem hemopoietic system, where the blood forming organs are destroyed, and with that kind of death, the dose rate is usually 500 to 1,000 rem, and it will normally occur somewhere around 30 to 100 days following a single large dose of radiation. As we said, those kinds of problems are completely uh, not within the realm of using radiation as a diagnostic tool, and most of us are not going to be involved in that. The second consideration for effects of radiation is the genetic effect. The genetic effect comes about when the reproductive cells of an individual are involved with radiation and there is damage to that cell which will create a problem in that embryo and fetus and future generations. The chances of this kind of a problem existing in those of us that work in x-ray diagno diagnosis is very, very low because we wear aprons and leaded aprons so that we are protecting the gonads of the workers to a very high degree. The place where this is probably of more concern are those workers that are involved in the mining of radioactive materials such as uranium mines where there is less protection or in some cases almost no protection or those individuals working around nuclear power plants where the dose rate is more evenly distributed to the body and it's more difficult to protect the reproductive organs. As we look at this, it has to be kept in perspective, and one of the stories that I remember very well when I was in training in radiology was an elderly lady about 80 years old that had a neoplasm of which the physicians were wanting to treat the neoplasm with radiation therapy, and the lady kept insisting that she did not want radiation therapy because she had read someplace that radiation would affect her children. And so you have to realize that when you're 80 years old, your children have already been born, so you're not going to harm them with the radiation. And so this genetic effect has to be during the reproductive cycle of the individual. Also in keeping in perspective, as you look at this effect, is trying to look at the reasonableness or the comparative risk Another study of interest to kind of put perspective on this is a study of fruit flies that were done several years ago where they found that if they would raise the temperature by about one to two degrees of the fruit flies, they could get many more mutations in the offspring of those fruit flies. And the author of this then related that to the concept 
of men wearing briefs versus boxer shorts in that if you wear briefs you are probably raising the scrotal temperature by at least one to two degrees which may be more hazardous from the standpoint of creating mutations than radiation. And so if you believe in that theory, then perhaps all of us men working in radiation, if we would wear kilts, we'd be back in gear and would not have as much damage to our children as if we were working in radiation. So that puts a perspective, and it's not that it's unimportant to us, but the chances of these kinds of things happening is why the standards have been established and why the low limits are available for radiation workers. Another way to look at the effects of radiation by a newer classification that is used today is what is called the stochastic effects and the non-stochastic effects. This differentiates the event as to how the radiation is perceived in causing the particular result. The stochastic event is described as a random action or sort of a hit or miss possibility of something happening. The kinds of things that would happen in this classification is such as the genetic effects where the radiation would damage the particular DNA of a molecule of a reproductive cell and therefore there will be mutations or changes in that particular organism later on. Here, it's either hit or miss, and as you increase the dose, even though it's hit or miss, you increase the probability of that action happening. And so in very low doses, the chance of this happening is low, but as you increase the dose, the greater the probability will be of that event happening. And some of the things that, particularly in the genetics, is where this event is most important. Then in the non-stochastic effects, there is the idea that as the dose goes up, the severity of the clinical syndrome is also going to go up. It sort of is, there is a threshold for clinical significance. For example, if you have very low doses, you probably will not be able to detect any particular change or clinical disease in the individual. But once you pass a certain point, then the disease becomes evident, and if you continue to increase the dose, the severity will get worse and worse. An example, particularly in this area, would be like radiation burns, where you can get low doses of radiation, and looking at the skin, you would be able to see no particular change. But as the dose got high enough, you would eventually be able to see some possible redness of the skin, and if you continue to expose the skin to radiation, the severity will go on to where it becomes tremendously erythematous and swollen, and that there will eventually be sloughing of the skin. And so this is a relationship of dose and severity in this particular area. Another example of where this may happen is in the opacification of the lens or the development of cataracts from radiation. Again, with the very low dose of diagnostic radi radiation, that is very unlikely to happen. But for example, if you take a dog and were to give radiation therapy of very high doses to the head, then you might, with those high doses, be able to pass the threshold and eventually see lens opacification in those particular animals. And the threshold is defined as being able to see clinically significant or health impairing conditions resulting from passing or being above the threshold dose. The people that study radiation and make recommendations on how much exposure individuals can receive have set maximum permissible doses. Now, with a maximum permissible dose, it is not the goal to try to get this, but to do what they say is an ALARA. This says the dose must be as low as reasonably achievable. So the goal is to get the least amount, but still recognizing that there are some limits which do not create adverse risk to the individuals. 
people are then classified into two general categories in determining the maximal permissible dose. The first category are those of us that are employed and work in radiation, and we are called occupationally exposed. The second category is the general public. That is individuals that are not working in radiation and have not agreed to accept the occupational exposure. For the occupationally exposed individual, the maximum permissible dose is five rem per year. And this applies to all men, to non-pregnant women, and to individuals that are 18 years of age and greater. From this, you can see that the pregnant women are excluded at this particular maximum permissible dose, and individuals less than 18 are excluded from this permissible dose. It is felt, however, that this dose is not going to pass the threshold to create the conditions that we have talked about previously. In this same recommendation, then, is another maximum permissible dose for the general public. The general public would be like clients that are bringing their animals in to the veterinarian's office, to receptionists who are not working with the radiation or are directly involved in being a worker there, or any other employees not directly involved in the exposure process. The feeling is that the general public must be protected at a much greater level than those individuals that are occupationally exposed. And therefore, the general public maximum permissible dose is 0.1 rem per year. And as you can see, considerably less than what those of us that are working in radiation. One way to put perspective on the doses in relationship to the maximum permissible dose is to look at some studies that we have done with the university radiology technologists. At the university, we produce approximately 1,200 animal exposures per month. This, of course, is much higher than you're going to be producing in your given practice. The average technologist's exposure as measured by the film badge is 30 millirems per month so that you can have an example of how much exposure we're getting. That translates then into a year of being 360 millirems or 0.36 rems per year that our technologists are getting exposed to. That compares to the maximum permissible dose of five rems per year. So you can see that we're way below the amount of radiation that is allowed for occupationally exposed individuals. And again, remembering in your particular practice situation where you're probably at the most producing 40 to maybe 60 exposures per month, your dose is going to be way less than what is indicated with our technologists and on many of the film badges that you will wear when they come back from the company, they will probably have minimal exposure, meaning that it cannot be detected at the low level of exposure that you're receiving. The second consideration that we need to think about is the exposure that has been advocated for the embryo fetus and the concern for pregnancy in women occupationally exposed. The fetus has been set as a total exposure of 0.5 rem for the nine months of the pregnancy. Or they recommend that it be no more than 0.05 rem per month. So they don't want the fetus to get all of its exposure in one time, but to make sure that it's spread out over the entire gestation period. And this exposure rate excludes the medical exposure should that become necessary during the pregnancy. So this is the occupational exposure of the fetus while the mother is working in radiation. If 
the a pregnant individual is going to be working in radiation, then we recommend that two film badges be worn, one at the collar, which will continue to monitor the dose rate to the head and neck of the individual, and then a second film badge worn at the waistline underneath the lead apron, which will be the monitor of the fetus. Our feeling is that with the workload that most veterinary practices have, that the exposure to the fetus of an individual that is pregnant working in radiology is very minimal and well below the maximum permissible doses as established by the National Committee. It must be remembered in looking at these maximum permissible doses that for the occupationally exposed individual, this is for the amount of radiation that you receive from working with radiation itself, of being the employee, and that if during this period of time, for other medical reasons, you are required to get radiographs made of yourself, then any dose related to that medical examination is excluded and is not counted in the five REMS per year. As all of us are aware, working with radiation can be hazardous to our health, although the risk for the majority of us working in radiation is relatively minimal. I have worked in radiology about 30 years and my total film badge accumulation was around nine rims. That is a very small amount when you consider the volume of work that I have been participated in over the years. To help you understand that, you know, you need to have a very healthy respect for radiation and take all the safety precautions you can, but you don't need to be afraid of it because under normal, safe operating conditions, it's not going to have a deleterious effect. And so to put that in perspective a little bit, we would like to show two comparisons that are used by the National radiation safety people to put perspective on the hazards of radiation. One is looking at the fatality rates per 100,000 people employed in various industries. And so this means that there will, you know, that looking at the death rate or the possibility of death in a given industry. And as you can see, when we start out here, manufacturing is relatively safe in that it's a 0 0.6 for, per 10,000 individuals. Service is 0 0.7. Even working for the government is 0 0.9. And then we get to the more hazardous ones in transportation and utilities, where the death rate is 2.7. Construction, 3.9. Agricultural, 4.6. And then mining and quarrying, 6. Now one of the interesting things that has been made a comparison from Canada, who has some very good data, is that they studied the mining in general versus people that were mining only uranium and found that the death rate actually in uranium mines was less than the death rate from general mining. So that would tend to negate that the radiation has very much to do with the death rate as far as mining is concerned. So if we look at all industries, then the death rate is about 1.1 per 10,000 employees. If we look at how the maximum permissible dose rate of five REMS per individual worker was established, it was established to guarantee that radiation workers would be less than one. So in a sense, we're, safe, we're safer working in radiation than almost any other industry that we've talked about here, perhaps except manufacturing. So it's a risk that all of us should be willing to take. The other comparison that is made for risk is to look at the effects on life shortening. And life shortening is one of the possible consequences of radiation. And the comparison here has been made that if you're driving down the highway and you drive 0 0.13 or 15 you know, hundredths of a mile, that is equivalent to 1,000 of a rim. So we're trying to, again, equate the effect of shortening your life between radiation and highway driving. 
So if that's true then, driving 750 miles, which probably all of us do every year or many times a year, is equivalent to the five REMS or the maximum permissible dose. So in a sense, we're all going out on the highway and driving and accepting that risk as being reasonable and therefore we must look at possibly the radiation hazard that we're exposed to is also a reasonable risk for being able to participate in a profession, taking care of animals and having a very enjoyable time and contributing to society. The other side that any of you that are smokers, the comparison has been made that one puff on a cigarette is also equivalent in life shortening to about 0.001 rem or one thousandth of a rem. Or if you equate that out, then roughly 20 packs of cigarettes equals the same hazard as the maximum permissible dose for an individual working in radiation or the five rems. Now, I'm not quite sure what happens when the smoker works in radiation, whether those two add up or not, but at least it gives you a perspective on how the radiation, the smoking, and the highway driving has an effect. And so I feel that the radiation is an acceptable hazard that you can accept and be careful, but not be fearful. To help you understand a little bit of the arrangement within the veterinary hospital and understand the different areas with the maximum permissible dose differences, these areas are divided into a controlled area where the people there are allowed the five rem per year exposure. These individuals that are working in this area must be aware of the radiation that is in that area. They must expect some exposure risk and at least be aware and accept that. They have a knowledge of the effects of radiation and the possible harm and they have a knowledge of the safety practices. So those of you that are helping restrain animals and are setting the machines and working with radiation fall into this controlled area. In a veterinary practice, the controlled area is primarily the x-ray room because that's where the radiation is, that's where you're going to be working, and during that period of time, these are the criteria that determine your status in a controlled area. Now the rest of the veterinary hospital, particularly the reception area, the exam rooms and so forth, these are non-controlled areas and the general public have access to these areas. And you'll remember when we were talking about maximum permissible doses, the general public must be protected to a much higher level than those individuals that are working in a controlled area. Their maximum annual exposure is 0.1 rem. And therefore, we have to take very high care of them because in addition to being the general public, these individuals have no knowledge or awareness of any kind of radiation hazard that might be around. And so we have to protect them very, very well. Now, in trying to differentiate these two, since radiation does pass through walls and can penetrate material, some special situations that we have to be concerned of in making this division is, for example, if the x-ray machine is on a floor and there is a basement underneath that floor, then we have to be aware that part of that radiation will be going through the floor into the basement. And therefore, if any non-controlled individuals are going to be in that area, they must be added barrier so that the radiation is absorbed at the floor and not allowed into the basement. The other special area is where we are doing horizontal beam radiography where the cassette is vertical and the beam is going against a wall. We have to be aware of what's on the other side of the wall. And is there any possibility that the other side of the wall is non-controlled individuals? And therefore, again, we have to have extra protection in the wall so that we can guarantee that if someone is sitting on the other side of the wall, they are not going to get more than the 0.1 rem per year. So understanding these two areas and knowing how you have to work will help you understand the different individuals and making sure that no one comes into this controlled area that does not meet the criteria. We want to review for you the principles of reducing exposure. 
even though we've talked about there is a maximum permissible dose range, our goal is still to get the least amount of exposure possible. And so when we look at the principles of doing that, there are really three principles that we must consider and keep in mind at all times. The first one of these is reducing the time of exposure so that if we can get the exposure made in a shorter period of time, there will be less radiation and therefore less hazard for each of us that is around that beam at the time of exposure. If the exposure is made, then the second principle is that we need to try to increase the distance between the beam and ourselves as much as possible. And we'll talk about how we can increase the distance to get us away from the beam and away from the hazard. And then last, if we have to be in the room or close by for the restraint or confinement of the animal, then what kind of shielding can we look at to try to protect you from the beam? And most of the shielding we'll be looked at will be clothing and garments that can wear as well as some possible structure. So we'll look at each one of these and consider some of the important aspects of it. If we're trying to reduce the time of exposure, probably the most important thing that we can consider is making sure that we do it right the first time. You see, if you do an exposure and it's not perfect or it's not diagnostic and you have to repeat the exposure, then you're really doubling the amount of radiation that you're exposed to. So that's why it's so important that we give consideration to all the factors that make sure that we do it right the first time. For example, have we set the correct exposure factors? One of the ways that we'll get caught in this is that if we've got an animal, for example, that we're doing the thorax on, and the lateral and the VD measurements of the animal are not the same, have we reset the machine after we've made the lateral before we make the VD? If we've not reset the machine, then we're not going to have the proper exposure factors, and we're going to wind up with a non-diagnostic radiograph. So be very careful that we reset the machine after every exposure. Secondly, do we have correct positioning? Almost all animals to get good quality positioning have to be restrained very much. And if the animal is twisting or turning or breathing heavily, then we're not going to get good positioning. And if the positioning is inadequate, we probably cannot see the anatomical structures that we need to in order to arrive at a proper diagnosis. So in getting this proper positioning, we may use restraint such as sedation or anesthesia. We may use tape. We may use positioning blocks, and we'll demonstrate those as we progress through the tape. And then lastly, the film must be processed correctly depending upon what your mechanism is. If you're in hand processing, then the question is, is the timing very accurate in the hand processing? If you have an automatic processor, perhaps there's less chances of errors, but we also realize there's a cost factor in that. But whatever your technique that you've established for your darkroom, make sure you follow it very closely. For example, if you're developing a film for about three minutes and either under or over develop it by 15 seconds, you can make very marked difference in whether you have a good quality film or not. So the timing becomes very, very important. And then another way to look at reducing the exposure time is the use of high-speed screens. The screens are inside the cassette and contribute to the exposure, and we should be using the highest speed screens possible because the higher speed screens allow us to use less exposure time in order to have a diagnostic radiograph. And then thirdly, we need grids to control scatter radiation to have good quality films, but non-grid techniques are possible on thinner parts where the scatter radiation is not as great. And so if we're using a thinner part, less than 10 centimeters, and most radiographs of the extremity, particularly in small animals and horses, then we will not be using a grid. And a grid does absorb primary radiation as well as the scatter, so it takes more radiation to make a grid technique radiograph than a non-grid. So if at all possible, we're going to try not to use a grid if it's not necessary to produce the quality of film. The second thing, then, is distance. And understanding the effect of distance on your 
radiation exposure, you need to at least understand the inverse square law. And the inverse square law says that as you double the distance, you only get 25% of the exposure. So there's great advantages of backing away from the primary beam or increasing your distance. For example, if you're one foot away from where the primary beam is and the animal being radiographed, you will get a, you will get a certain amount of radiation exposure but if you go from one foot to two foot, then you only get 25% of the exposure that you would at one foot away. So it certainly it behooves you to try to move your body and your arms and so forth back and get out of the beam as much as possible. The ultimate distance criteria is to get out of the room. And if you're going to get out of the room, then it means that the animal has to be in perfect positioning and everything has to go without you restraining the animal. So that means that we are going to use a lot more sedation and anesthesia and a lot more positioning devices such as feed troughs and sponges and gauzes and we'll have to tape the animal down in certain places. But by doing all that, we can get the animal positioned and actually leave the room, which is the safest procedure that we can possibly get. And then again, we can increase distance particularly a large animal with the use of cassette holders where we're in the field trying to make radiographs and the cassette is handheld, you're very close and so we want to use cassette holders where the cassette can be on a long pole and you can be three to four feet away from the cassette at the time that the radiograph is made. And then fourthly is collimation and collimation says we are restricting the size of the beam at the x-ray tube so that the x-ray beam is only striking that anatomical portion that we need for the diagnosis. It's not necessary to spray the radiation and completely make all the film black if the part that we want to look at is only going to be a small portion of that. So we need to consider collimating the beam and making it as small as possible in order to get a good quality radiograph. And then thirdly, if we have to be in the room then we have to consider what kind of shielding are we going to try to work with to stop the radiation so it does not strike our body. The ones most commonly used are lead gloves and aprons and most of you at least are aware of those. They come in two thicknesses, 0.5 millimeters of lead and 0.25 millimeters of lead. You must remember however that with this amount of lead the glove is designed to protect you from the scatter radiation. It says that it's really effective of the radiation that is bouncing off the animal or bouncing off the table coming at you. It will not stop the primary radiation. So if you have a, your hand and the lead glove shows up on a radiograph that you've made, what it says is your hand probably did receive some radiation because the lead is not sufficient to stop the primary beam. So be careful that you always have your lead, leaded gloves and hands outside the beam. In special cases then, we can build walls and shields. This is particularly useful where we build a little fly wall in front of the control booth so whoever is standing at the control knobs and turning the knobs and working the exposure will not be exposed because they're behind a wall barrier that has sufficient absorption to stop the radiation. They also make shields on wheels that can be run around and pushed around the table which you can stand behind. There are some plastic shields with lead embedded in them that now hang from the ceiling so that you can develop a pretty good barrier so that you're protected. It doesn't mean you don't wear your lead gloves and aprons, but at least it's an added barrier that's trying to prevent you from getting exposed. And then lastly, the use of thyroid shields is becoming fairly common and that comes about because the lead aprons have a fairly large gap at the neck and as you remember the thyroid is one of the organs we're trying to prevent the radiation from exposure and so the thyroid shield just closes up the V part of the apron so that the thyroid gland is protected. So in looking and reviewing these we have to remember that if we're going to protect ourselves and not get exposed to any great extent, then we have to consider the time of exposure and make it as short as possible, 
we have to consider distance in that we want to get ourselves as far away from the primary beam as we can. And if we can't get ourselves away, then we have to consider the use of shielding to protect ourselves if we're going to be in the room. 